over-criminalizing the poor, the mentally ill, the vulnerable, and racialized persons and indigenous persons. And we do have a problem in Canada. I mean, 50% of the women prisoners in our federal jails now are indigenous women, even though indigenous people are about 5% of our population. Welcome to the third episode of The Crisis Storm, where we talk about the impacts on community from homelessness, crime, um, mental health, uh, and a general breakdown in communication. Today, we are going to be speaking to uh, a former British Columbia judge uh, and a human rights lawyer that lives here in Kamloops, and his name is Bill Sundu. Welcome to the studio, Bill. Good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you for coming. Bill, first of all, tell, tell me, who is Bill Sundu? Well, that's a pretty profound question, but um, briefly, I'm born in New Westminster, raised in Williams Lake. My parents were first-generation immigrants from India. Um, neither had any formal education. Um, there were lots of struggles for my parents, uh, but uh, this country has been a great gift to me good public education system. I uh, went to university. I have three degrees, uh, including a master's in international human rights law from the University of Oxford. I'm a lawyer uh, this year, just in fact this month. It's 40 years since I graduated from law school, so the decades move quickly. Wow. Uh, 10, 11 of those 40 years I've spent in, in the judiciary here in Kamloops and surrounding communities, also sitting in other communities in British Columbia uh, as a provincial court judge, which is really the front line and deals with uh, approximately 95 to 96 percent of all criminal offenses, including family law, youth criminal justice, and small claims. I practiced in Williams Lake for a number of years, and then when I was appointed to the bench, it was here in Kamloops in 1996. It's my home, married two children, raised here. And I'm also on the list of counsel of the International Criminal Court in The Hague that deals with genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. I'm fortunate to be accredited there. I try to keep my knowledge base up. Those are the most serious crimes of concern to the international community. Um, and I've also been um, appointed on a couple of occasions to travel to Tunisia in the aftermath of the Arab Spring to train their judiciary, merging their country emerging from a dictatorship in human rights and the administration of justice. And um, um, in the last number of years, I work as a criminal law duty counsel on the Haida Gwaii court circuit. I would say 80% of the people that I deal with there in, in criminal law jurisdiction are Haida. But throughout my entire 40 years, I've been in, as a trial lawyer and I have extensive experience um, in particularly in criminal law, youth criminal law, child protection, and uh, representing a, a, a wide segment of the uh, Aboriginal community in the Kamloops, uh, Thompson, uh, Caribou region, and, and in Haida Gwaii as well. That was fantastic. So I think in short, you are definitely the subject matter expert that we're looking to talk to when it comes to our justice system and the impacts on this community and other communities like us with respect to crime. Um, I think maybe we could start off with from your perspective as both uh, a former court judge, uh, uh, a criminal lawyer, uh, and uh, a citizen of Kamloops. How do you perceive um, the justice system um, and the impacts of crime on the community within Kamloops? Uh, so we have an excellent justice system uh, that has evolved over the centuries that we've inherited from Great Britain. We place great uh, 
uh, constitutional and as a matter of values, democratic values on fairness, a presumption of innocent on rights and freedom, and yet balancing that with the needs of the public for a protection, uh, you know, protection of the public, a safe, just, peaceful society. And our BNA Act in Canada, our founding constitution, is built on peace, order, and good government. Uh, what I would say about the criminal justice system is that it is um, the, the final catch-all when everything goes wrong. And too many criticisms uh, and expectations are placed on the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is just that, but it cannot solve the, the, the whole assortment of complex uh, problems around economic issues, social issues, housing and health. And the criminal justice system just cannot deal with that. And too often I do believe that it is used as a political football. I mean, it's an easy score to attack the criminal justice system. There's a lot of cliches about it. It's easy politics. But if we really want meaningful, responsible solutions and we want to respect rights, that we value as a democratic country, that we've even sent our troops, young men, to die in foreign theaters for those rights and freedoms, for the, the struggles for universal suffrage for women and racial minorities, indigenous people, um, and, 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 and protecting our core democratic rights, then we have to understand that the, the criminal justice system is integral to that. And what I would also say is, so as a judge, I've sat in judgment of people. As a defense lawyer, which has been most of my career, I've defended people. And you know, they're, they're, they're often the most unpopular types of people to defend. But I've also prosecuted cases. And there is a saying that a good lawyer should be able to pick up a file at any time and be able to prosecute it or defend it. So what I'm saying is good work in our criminal justice system involves objective analysis of the evidence, the constitutional principles, presumption of innocence, and a humane touch about insight into people. What's, what's the best path, best path forward for this individual? And it also means being honest. Like uh, I know that with my clients, um, I'm very honest. I, I give them the straight goods. If, if they give me the BS line, I tell them cut the BS. This is what it looks like. The evidence is overwhelming. Let me see what solution I can come up with for you. What's going on in your life? Is it a housing problem? Is it mental health? Is it poverty? Uh, and it, there's a whole slew of societal problems that fall on our laps mm -hmm. that, as I've said, and going full circle now to what I started to say is the criminal justice system doesn't have the resources, nor is it designed, nor is it equipped to deal with a great many of the other complex societal problems. So when everything fails, it ends up in the criminal justice system. Okay. I know that our justice system is better than some countries out there. Um, I understand that. I feel uh, privileged to, to be a guest in this country uh, with my parents having immigrated here. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I know that um, over the years, there's a lot of people that have a lot of compassion fatigue right now. Uh, we see, you know, increase in crime. We see dramatic impacts on business and the economy mm -hmm. um, as a result of, of crime. Um, what do you say as a, uh, you know, a former court judge uh, with respect to the, the nature of catch and release right now? It's like they're out hobby fishing, um, you know, the, the RCMP, you know, they, they catch them, they, you know, lock them up for the night and they're out the next day or shortly thereafter, um, you know, with respect to uh, having had, you know, a dramatic impact on a business, breaking into a business, what have you, regardless of what their circumstances are. So. This is, a, a, you've asked a very, very big question. Right. It requires a complex, quite long answer. I'll try my best in the you time have the that stage. we're allotted. So um, I, I'm going to push back a bit against that phrase, catch and release. Okay. You know, um, if we really want meaningful 
understanding of what's going on, evidence-based, respect for evidence, and solutions, we have to get past these kind of phrases. And that is, the reason I say that is, it's an easy phrase for a lot of people to use out there, and people leave it at that. It, it avoids going t further up the ladder to understand th the slew of complex issues. Now, uh, what I would say, is, as a practicality of what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, and also if we look at the context of the pandemic. And I do want to talk about the report that was prepared by Amanda Butler and Doug Lepard for the province. Now that's a 150 page report. And I think that's some excellent work in there to deal with the complex problems that we have. So I, I've been told that when I was a judge and I was told this by a deputy regional Crown Council, so senior Crown Council, that I was known as a law and order judge. So maybe that means no shrinking violet. Um, but I would also like to believe that I was fair and compassionate and brought, I believe, the fullness of my life experience to my work every day. So when it comes to uh, matters ending up before the courts, I can tell you that I think there's a linkage there and where is sometimes the breakdown. First of all, are the police properly investigating matters and actually preparing proper files to the Crown Council? Are the Crown Council, which, and we're dealing with individuals and everybody has their own skills, their own initiative. Some people have a great work ethic, some don't. I'm not, you know, smearing anybody or throwing the net wide here, but sometimes I look at files and I say, well, the police could have done better. So is there a problem in even preparing that file and giving it to Crown Council? Is the individual Crown Council that, whose lap that file falls on looking at that properly prepared and preparing a proper case to go before a judge to argue this person should be detained, denied on bail? A judge can't do anything unless that file comes into his or her court. Mm. We can't wave the magic wand. We have to uh, deal with matters that only come before us. Judges don't get to pick and choose the cases that come before them. That's a decision of the prosecutor. And in many ways, the prosecutor is the most powerful person in our system because the prosecutor decides what to prosecute, who to prosecute, and what should go into court and what should not. The judge can only adjudicate the case before him or her. Another thing is that police also can release people on appearance notices without anything going to the court until it eventually gets to the court weeks or months down the road. They can also place people on undertakings on conditions. Sometimes those conditions are reasonable and sometimes they're unreasonable and set people up for failure. Now this is a big area of concern, not just the police, but the judges also. Uh, imposing conditions sometimes that really have little relevance to the original charge. So that's, that's one piece of it all. W what's actually ending up before the courts? Maybe some things are not. The other thing is, is that as far as bail laws go in this Canada, and there's a lot of uh, attack on the justice system, bail laws really haven't changed. There's three key ingredients that a judge has to look at when a matter comes before him or her. Now keep in mind, we have a presumption of liberty. A person is entitled to their liberty until they are convicted, unless they're convicted, presumption of innocence. So in other words, we just don't detain people whole as bullets while they're still presumed innocent. That could affect their, their job. They could lose their job. They could uh, lose the ability to feed their family uh, and, and they lose their liberty. So the onus is in our law on the Crown Council to say to a judge, you ought to detain this person, and with good reason, good evidence, here's their record, here's the offense, the strength of our case, or, well, you should release them on conditions that ought to regulate the person in the community. Protect the integrity of the prosecution, protect potential victims, uh, reduce the risk of offending with appropriate balance of conditions when they're still presumed innocent. So um, th that's the reality about bail. But the three key areas are, when you look at, at that, is that so we have a presumption of liberty until a person is convicted or enters a guilty plea, then we sentence them. And the issues are in bail law, three key areas, as I've said. One is, is the person 
uh, going to abscond, not attend court. So are they going to attend court and keep their court appearances? Two, is there a substantial likelihood of reoffending? And three, this is a catch-all, will it, will a reasonable member of the public looking at this, will it uh, uh, bring the administration of justice into disrepute? It could be a unique type of offense, or it could be a serious offense, or something that, that really shocks the conscience of, of the community, but you, you believe, well, the person will keep their court dates, they're not likely to reoffend, but this is one that really requires their detention. That bail law has been in place for a very long time, and it hasn't changed. So what I'm saying, judges have the tools to, in appropriate cases where the evidence is there, to say, sorry sir or madam, you're going to be detained until your trial comes along. Because of these following factors, I find on the evidence, the submissions made before me, that's what should happen here. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada in 2020 came up with a decision, and there's some critique of this or concern about this, but be mindful that that came up almost coincident with the pandemic, and the pandemic plays a big part on, on the, the acuteness or the increase of the problems that we have seen. And Butler and Lepard also say that in their report, and I think most criminal law analysts would say that as well. What the Supreme Court of Canada said is, and this has become something that has evolved over the years, is that Canada has even come under international criticism for saying, you have more people in your provincial jails that are not convicted of anything, just detained on remand, about 60%. You have more people there than are actually sentenced on offenses. And this is not good. People are severely impacted in their liberty, their jobs, their ability to support their families, their reputations by being unreasonably and overly detained. So for example, in 1991, we had about 26% of people in our jails in Canada that were on remand, not yet convicted, but detained. Whereas by uh, 2016, we had something like 60%. The consequences, yes, the consequences to people who have not been found guilty of anything are still presumed innocent and detention is, first of all, it's very expensive, but it's very destructive to people's lives, their reputations. Person may subsequently be acquitted, damage is done. It can take a long time to even get to trial with, with the vast number of matters before our courts and the complexity of trials. Um, so there are s serious consequences there, and it also clogs our courts and avoids the judges getting to, in our system, to the really serious cases that should be heard, and should be heard in a timely manner. So the Supreme Court of Canada said, look judges, if you're going to put people on conditions, it's still bail, but it's out in the community, they have to be reasonable and proportionate. You're adding conditions that have nothing to do with the original offense, and you're setting up people for breaches. And I can tell you in my experience, and this is what the Supreme Court of Canada also said, is that more people, or a great many, become more criminalized for what we call the breaches than the original offense. They may even be found not guilty of the original offense, but they become criminalized for things like, if you say to a person who has an alcohol addiction, you can't drink. Or if you say to a person with drug addiction, you can't use drugs. Or if you say to somebody who's homeless or in a precarious homeless situation, you're on a curfew and they can't make it to their job. Mm. Or they breach because they haven't got a place to stay or there's not enough shelter room. Even shelters, there's all kinds of rules and people get kicked out. I've had a lot of people breach for that and that goes way, way, way back, way back before the pandemic in the years that I even sat as a judge on this bench, on the bench here. Um, things like that. And so, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada said you have to uh, 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 have reasonable bail conditions. We're over-criminalizing the poor, the mentally ill, the vulnerable, and racialized persons and indigenous persons. And we do have a problem in Canada. I mean, 50% of the women prisoners in our federal jails now are indigenous women, even though indigenous people are about 5% of our population. Indigenous people continue to be over-incarcerated in Canada in hugely disproportionate numbers. Could you give that, that number again of so Indigenous females incarcerated? In our federal jails. Federal sentence is anything over two years. Provincial jail is anything two years less a day. In our federal jails, 50% of the women 
that are now imprisoned are indigenous. Wow. It's, it's astonishing. So, so, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada said, and, and this has been a huge struggle in our criminal law over the years, our parliament has struggled with this, is saying, how can we reduce the over-incarceration of people that are mentally ill, people that are suffering from brain injury and trauma, the poor and the vulnerable, the marginalized, and particularly Indigenous persons. Now, this is also something that the United Nations has critiqued us for. And, and we also have a problem when it comes to, uh, quote, black Canadians, uh, over-policing. You know, um, a, a, an indigenous per, uh, person in this country is 10 times more likely to be killed by police than a non-indigenous person. So we have some systemic racism or systemic issues there as well. In Canada. In Canada. So. When people say there's catch and release, what I say is that, now this goes to the pandemic, the pandemic created a unique situation where it appears that everyone in the system, from lawyers to prosecutors to police as well, and judges were saying, we have to be really careful about who we're sending to our jails because of COVID in the jails. Are we really setting people up? for disease. I mean, I had a client who was at very advanced stage of cancer and he did deserve a jail sentence as drug trafficking prior. But, you know, we had medical evidence that said from the doctors, he's extremely vulnerable as it is. In addition to his cancer, second time around with cancer, he's got serious heart problems, immune immunity issues. He even gets the flu, he could die. You send him to jail, judges, we had letters from doctors, um, he may die. So what happens in that case? Actually, in that case, he did get sent to jail in any case. Luckily, he didn't die, but um, he had to be put in segregation, administrative uh, detention, separate from the rest of the prisoners. It was a very hard time. I'm not saying that we should be sympathetic for him, but I'm saying there was a trend to reduce incarceration, and that led to more people on the streets and people that were, uh, and the pandemic overall, we know we've, we've heard a lot more about generally in our population about mental health increases, loneliness, isolation, uh, people with economic issues about reduced employment and income, um, a lack of ability to get services. I mean, you know, the gridlock in our hospitals that emergency mental health services, things shutting down, mental health issues exploded. And because the courts overall the criminal justice system weren't sending people as many detaining them there's a backlog and those people ended up on the streets committing a lot of the mischief I'll call it and the crimes street crime I th I would like to believe and I think that some of that backlog is being reduced now but some of those people got off I'm, a, I'm aware that our own staff sergeant here um, is it Sid Lecky, or I forget who the current one is. Sid Sid Sid's is gone, right? is gone. Yeah, and there's there's a new um, head cop, right? Who I have not yet met. Yeah, but, but I read recently in Camus this week that he said that of the pr so-called what they've identified as um, uh, repeat offenders yes. in this community, eight of the sixteen are now in the system or doing jail. So what I'm getting at is the pandemic made things worse. Uh, and hopefully we're clearing that up and going forward it will not be as acute. We, you know, uh, people that should go to jail definitely should go to jail. And I've sent them to jail as a judge and I as a lawyer give my clients honest advice. Here's what it looks like. Evidence is against you. If you plead guilty, I can do this for you. But if you go to trial and you lose, and in my opinion you probably will on this case because the evidence is strong, you're going to get a harder sentence. Well, people immediately focus and say, oh, okay, well then cut me the deal. I will plead guilty now. The judge will understand that I've saved the taxpayer a lot of time and expense and the uncertainty of a trial. I might get a little bit lesser time. Now there's a whole other side and we'll get into that perhaps a bit later is even when we send people to jail or not, but they're on custodial or uh, community-based sentences, do we actually have services that are meaningfully addressing the complexity of problems? And I would say no. Okay. So let's, let's tackle this um, as two separate issues. Mm -hmm. There's the corrections and there's the, um, the immediate justice for victims. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let's talk about the justice for victims first. The perception that is in community with a, a significant amount of our population is that um, that let's just say they have compassion fatigue, especially mm -hmm. business to a large degree. Their businesses are constantly broken into because of COVID, because of the pressures of inflation, their costs are up. They're barely making their bills, having to support multiple families, not just their own. And quite often, um, the justice that they see um, is very little uh, with respect to the impacts on them. Okay. They're scared. Um, they are worried what's around the corner, what's coming next. Is it ever going to stop? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? So what I would say is that we should be careful what we ask for because we can lose a lot of very valuable rights. There's always political leaders prepared to exploit that. We see a rise of authoritarianism in the world. And when you have that kind of system, I mean, you can be like North Korea and have no crime. We don't want that kind of society or China. Um, but the problem is real. And so uh, here's what Butler and Lepard said, because, you know, they had a, a, a long run at looking at the thing pretty comprehensively for British Columbia. And I would say what's in British Columbia is not unique. It's right across Canada, the United States, and other countries as well. Overall, the crime rate has decreased over the last 30 years. However, they also said, and this is real, that there has been an increase of certain types of crime, and particularly the visible street crime affecting retail and business. Because people are out on the streets, they're homeless, there's some more acute mental health problems, psychiatric issues, poverty, lethal drug usage. I mean, we're not just talking fentanyl where people are at risk of dying. We're talking a toxic cocktail of methamphetamines and things like that that are creating more psychotic behaviors and hallucinations it's even causing prolonged use brain damage in people mm -hmm. um, and, and we also have and I deal with this and I've dealt this for over the years we also have people that are actually have, have suffered traumatic brain injuries out on our streets they're marginalized some of them are committing crimes homeless and so forth and similarly fetal alcohol syndrome the fetal alcohol syndrome is more complex because it's very hard to even get a diagnosis. But when you start to dig, and, and good lawyers should, saying, you know, this, this young man or this young woman is my client, what's not connecting here? And then you dig into the family and realize that the mother, was, you know, while in, in utero was heavily, heavily consuming alcohol. You could, and then you see the, the trajectory of that child's or that young adult's life, all the learning behaviors through the schools and the school records and so forth. You can pretty well draw a pretty fair conclusion that at least there's a reasonable argument to be made about fetal alcohol syndrome and, and the brain limitations and the trigger limitations of people. All of these things are out there. So um, one of the problems is, and this is where the criminal justice system is really challenged, is when you have things like the street crime, we're not talking high-end sophisticated crime. We're talking really nuisance, breaking windows, defecating on sidewalks, you know, shoplifting, maybe even an occasional break and enter, but the street type break and enter from the street marginalized that we're seeing, and there's, I don't know how many hundreds of, usually there's a head count, and even in a city like Kamloops of 100,000 people, maybe 200 people that are homeless. Um, theirs is a lower end crime. Most of them are also using drugs and substances and all these kind of things. And there's mental illness and psychiatric illness and brain damage and trauma. And some of them are just, they don't have those things, but they're just challenged by so many life circumstances. When they come before the court, you have to sentence according to proportionality. The gravity of the offense, how serious is it? What's the person's record? What is their circumstances? And we just can't give extended long, long sentences that are disproportionate. We are required to sentence similar offenders for similar offenses. 
And so often they're not long sentences. For example, if somebody's drug trafficking or homicide or a sexual assault um, or and we have break and enters in this community that are very serious. They're not done by the street people. They're done by sophisticated, organized criminals who mm -hmm. plan these crimes, right? They're going after high-end stuff, different category of people. Those people should be getting more serious, lengthier incarceration and consequences upon conviction. The lower end, what do you do? So, I mean, we are required by law to look at all alternatives to custody that still address protection of the public, deter people, denounce their conduct, make reparations for harm done, um, and also rehabilitate people. So we try to plug people in, but you know, if somebody smashes a window, what do you sentence them for? Um, if they have no record, it might be you know, a short period of probation with certain conditions, go to counseling, uh, reside where directed, report, you know, but if they don't have a home, you got a problem services, their sentence may finish before the services finish. Services often are lacking as well. I'll come back to that. That's a big piece. Um, and so uh, Butler and Lepard said short sentences are largely ineffective, but you can't sentence people lengthier just because you want to solve economic, social, and health problems. My own view is, is that, that, that there's, we have to stand back way back, and I'm going to get into the political realm because I have sat as a judge for 10 years dealing with people and as a lawyer for 40 years and even as a judge I'd sit there and I'd sit in judgment of people and I'd say I can't get this poor person a home. I can't get him a treatment bed. I can't get him psychiatric care except in limited circumstances. Um, I can't feed this person's kids. There's a food crisis. There's an affordability crisis now. Can't solve those problems. The criminal justice system is a blunt instrument, has limited tools, but it's an easy system to blame. Mm. But as a collective, as a society, and I know people will push back against this, but I really believe this, we have to ask, what kind of society do we want? And then, what are the steps we're prepared to take? And often the issue is, are we prepared to pay for it? Mm. Now, Butler and uh, Lepard go into a number of things. I've actually written them down, um, if I could refer to them, because yeah. I think they deal, they, have, they deal with and have a, a reasonable, from my perspective, template forward that balances human rights, that is compassionate, but with accountability and also the resources that are required in the complexity of problems that we have. It's 150 pages, so I made a quick bullet note. If, if sure, you, yeah. So, Please. so for example, um, what they say is, and, and I think that this is something that the federal government needs to look at because the federal government has jurisdiction over criminal law. One is, they said, we have to look at possibly what the UK has for restricted patient laws. We need some research in this area to divert the most serious mental disorders. Um, people that have complex mental health, psychiatric problems, substance abuse, serious substance abuse, and are at high risk to harm others. Because, you know, we've had these random stranger attacks. Mm -hmm. We've seen those. Um, we've seen across the country in subways, violent behavior. Now, it, overall numbers are not large, but they are disturbing and they are very unsettling and engender fear overall in our society. They have to be addressed. And what uh, uh, Butler and Lepard said is, what we may need to look at is some type of um, low secure units where are there are some restrictions on people's, li people's liberty. Now, they said voluntary or even enforced treatment, the evidence overall well, first of all, for enforced treatment doesn't work. But if you have these low secure units, um, which are safe, ensure the safety and security of the persons there, but also the community, but you have to have best practices and you have to have intensive rehabilitation that deals with social issues, mental health issues, housing, education, employment. They are required to reside there, but then you have to have psychiatrists, you have to have psychologists, nurses, doctors, counselors, it's expensive. 
This is but so is our crime. Yeah. What's happening in the community is also is expensive and it's not solving the problem. Now, I do believe, as, as a lawyer who practices human rights law and also constitutional law, that if the federal government were to design this system and properly resource it, that's the key. In a, if it went to the Supreme Court of Canada and the courts were to test the constitutionality of this, I think you can get the courts to say, we will accept this as under section one of the charter, which says you can allow certain rights to be infringed so long as it's reasonably and demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. If you said, this is humane, this is the nature of the problem we have, but we're not just gonna restrict these people in low security units. With, we're, here, here's what we do have. We have it in place, psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, nurses, counselors, housing, these social supports, these, then this is the evidence shows, call the experts to say this works to reduce recidivism and crime. I think that's, that's something that we as a country should look at, but are we prepared to pay for that? The other thing is, uh, uh, Butler and Lepard say, you know, even in our jails, um, we're just basically warehousing people. Uh, people we don't have for people with acute mental health issues, serious addiction issues. We really don't have the adequate resources for those. And that we people with serious issues who present criminality, who present all these disorders, we need to separate them from the rest of the prisoner population. You have to have intensive resources. Again, forensic services, psychologists, psychiatrists, and, and the appropriate resources directed at those people if you really want to solve the problems. We also have a problem post-release. We cut people out and say, here's your bus ticket, go home, that's it. Right? You can't cut, even if people are in custody and they are getting some degree of programming, or they're sitting there reflecting on what they've done as harm to society, hopefully, and, and a great many do. Um, you know, they are our neighbors. They, they're, our, they're people from our community um, with all kinds of challenges and, and mistakes in their lives. You can't just cut somebody out and, and then suddenly they're homeless or without financial resources to feed themselves or precarious housing or there's not suitable transition for housing or even counseling for them to continue. <clears throat> you put an addict back in the old environment with all their social cohorts in that neighborhood, the relapse uh, risk is too high. And also simple things like have psychiatric nurses at the courthouses regularly so that when a lawyer deals with somebody in custody that's been arrested by the police and the lawyer assesses or the sheriff say this person is presenting these, these problems, um, the psychiatric nurses should immediately be able to speak to that person and, and, and advise the lawyer to say, I think we need a further psychiatric assessment or psychological assessment here. Or I can make recommendations to, to the Crown and to the defense lawyer and the judge as to where this person needs to go now, so can you frame appropriate conditions. We did have that in Camelot's for a while and it was quite effective. Uh, but it's not consistently done around the province. So if it was effective, why do we no longer have it in Kamloops? Well, I think it's just a c consistency of resources and arranging that. that. Um, a pandemic also shut everything down. I mean, the, it, so we lost it with the pandemic? Yeah, and even in, in many places we never had it, in some places we did. Um, the other thing is simple things like therapeutic bail, where you say to a person, and I've done this, um, you've pled guilty, right? Or you've been found guilty, but we're going to delay sentencing and you're going to do A, B, C, D. And if you do them, you'll get a better sentence. But if you don't do them, then this is the consequence as an incentive. These are simple things that lawyers can do. Also, uh, th they said that, you know, we need an inventory. We, ne we need an adequate guideline for all lawyers, Crown and Defense, to say these are the resources that are available so we know where to send people. You know, one of the great things that I, that I used, uh, used to reflect on when I was a judge and, and continues as a lawyer is it ends when we sentence people. You know, we, we kind of just assume, well, off they go into corrections and we have no legal authority to deal with anything in corrections once a person's sentenced. 
um, you either say this is your prison term or your jail term and then there's a probation order to follow but probation is when their jail term has ended and then they're supervised by corrections probation officer with conditions okay mm -hmm. about where they reside how often you have to report who can they have contact with and not contact with where they may not be able to go in part of the community and it'll say things like counseling and treatment but try to get somebody in treatment bed is very very difficult um, but often um, there was sort of nudge nudge wink wink a lot of us didn't really know what happens in the jails what programs really are there or not mm -hmm. and I think we need better education of lawyers and judges to be able to have more meaningful understanding of that when they sentence people um, the other thing is is with certain types of jail sentences the person take some time to plug into a program in jail even if it's available and often they're not but some are but they finish their jail sentence and they're out never finish the program mm -hmm. I remember a few years back I had a, a sexual offender who got sentenced and the idea for the, the jail you know he himself had been sexually abused he sexually abused somebody breach of trust ought to have gone to jail did but one of the reasons we said in addition to you know the denunciation and sexual uh, offending is repugnant to the values of our society and we need to protect society from it you need to go to jail for a while you'll get programming there but by the time the, the program only in that instance only came along once a year and it didn't start until well into his sentence and his sentence finished and it was a lengthy sentence by the time he got kicked out his sentence was over he hadn't finished the program so uh, the, the, we do need to meaningfully look at if we seriously want to address these issues are we prepared to fund in a society where we have shortage of doctors we have an aging population we want long-term care we want to reduce the, the the pressure on emergency rooms we want better education and special ed teachers right we want to build more housing are we also then prepared to pay, uh, the, the, the expend the money to say, we're going to have to have more psychologists and psychiatrists. We're going to have to have specialized units in our jails for the really serious cases of mental um, brain injury, fetal alcohol syndrome, serious psychotic issues, mental health issues. Are we going to do it? Are we going to have those specialized units? Are we going to have that out in the community? Because people shouldn't just only access those even if we pay for them and set them up by being criminalized. The vast majority of people, even with addiction, uh, mental health issues, don't commit crimes. But they should, they have needs as well. Are we going to fund these, these, these acute resources? And on the context of all this, we have these incredibly lethal drugs out there. What are we going to do about that? My, my view always has been over the years, representing drug offenders, uh, sentencing them to jail, that we've lost the war on drugs, that we really exp have spent historically too much time going after the low-hanging fruit. We should give police the resources to avoid that, to go after the big boys and send them away because there is money laundering, illicit gains, corruption of our economic system, and destroying lives. 35,000 people have died in Canada since, what, 2016 in, in, in overdoses, 80% of them from fentanyl. This is persisting out there and people are dying. And the other thing is a great many of the people that are dying are not criminals. They're not people charged with criminal offenses. They're recreational users too. That's often lost in the confusion around it. We think it's a street addict. But in fact, a great many people are somebody that die from overdose of somebody has a job. Friday night they go to a party. There's alcohol, there's drugs. Overdose, die. So this is a really insidious thing, drugs in our society. And that's another complex topic. But I can tell you the great, great many, always over the 40 years in my involvement in the criminal justice system, a great percentage of criminal offending is induced by addiction. Alcohol is a big one, big one, and drugs. Okay. This is a good spot for us to take a quick break. But right after the messages, hopefully we can paint a brighter picture because so far it's been pretty bleak. Mm -hmm. 
So we'll be right back right after these messages. We live in a world of conversations, conversations about life and survival. On a daily basis, mankind continually seeks a way to make our human experience better on all levels. We seek a way forward. Permit me to invite you to one of such conversations happening right here in Kamloops. On the 22nd of September, 2023, a prestigious event will be held. AIM Canada Mentorship Society and Mastermind Studios are putting together a special fundraising dinner towards the production of a documentary film series titled Finding a Way Forward. The documentary series will periscope the crisis storm in our community, including homelessness, mental health, drug overdose, crime and communication breakdown. Guest speaker is the Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association in Kamloops, Mr. Alfred Achoba. Music will be provided by the virtuoso himself, Jeremy Nishaw. You will also witness a thought-provoking art installation titled, Not All Dolls Live in Houses, from the talented Isa Jessica Jordan. Don't miss out on the mouth-watering dinner, which will be a Greek buffet with vegan options and lots of refreshments to nourish us. Bring your family, neighbors, bring your friends to this fundraising dinner in support of community mentorship and the development of a Kamloops-focused documentary film series to find a way forward. Date again is Friday, 22nd of September, 2023 Venue is the Kamloops United Church. Doors open at 5.30 p.m. for a 6 p.m. start. Limited tickets available, so grab yours today. To get tickets, go to www.aimcanadalegacyfund.ca slash events. For ourselves, our children, our community, let's find a way forward together. Have you ever considered launching a professional video podcast? Or creating a video-based interview? but felt daunted by the task, you may have wondered how to begin, how many cameras you need, who to interview, what to say, what kind of film set do you need, lighting, sound, what editing to use, and how to attract viewers or listeners. Did you know that Mastermind Studios can produce four to eight video podcast shows in a single day, complete with recording, editing, and distribution? Contact us now for your free consultation. Let's explore the possibilities we can work together to turn your maybe into a resounding yes. Give me a call. Mastermindstudios.ca Give us a call right now. 250-574-6902 Welcome back from the break. Uh, you're watching Crisis Storm the podcast and we're speaking with Bill Sandu uh, with regards to our justice system here in Canada, here in Kamloops, uh, and the impacts of crime uh, and homelessness uh, on our community uh, as a crisis storm. Uh, Bill, on the break we were talking a little bit about uh, maybe a little bit more of your past mm -hmm. and one of the things uh, that you alluded to but really didn't go into much detail uh, for uh, some of the people uh, that are watching this that don't necessarily know know you directly. Mm -hmm. um, you ran for office, uh, uh, not just once, I think, but more than once. Twice. What, what, uh, what were the motivations there? So when I was a judge and as a lawyer, 
um, I, I saw the limitations and the despair that, you know, we, we really cannot solve a great many problems. People think the justice system can solve all kinds of problems. It can't. It's a bl the criminal justice system particularly is a blunt instrument. So really what it is, is that it's a collective societal issue. And so who makes the law? Who allocates resources and finances and what the priorities and values articulates them of a country or a society? It's our politicians. So I felt that, that there was not much we could do as judges or as lawyers. And also we've seen um, the rise of authoritarian tendencies the attack on human rights globally, concerned about that, uh, polarization, division, scapegoating of certain elements of our population. These are worrisome trends. History is repeating itself. So I decided to run because ultimately it is a decision, I believe, um, Canadians collectively through governance, governments to say, what kind of society do we want and what are our priorities and how are we going to pay for it? So, for example, if you look at Portugal with, when it comes to drugs, Portugal has decriminalized drugs, but that alone is a small piece. You know, we, we've got a lot of controversy around decriminalization. Um, I do support decriminalization. That's not legalization. That's decriminalization. You can still regulate it, but alone it's not enough. But that's not all that Portugal does. Right. So Portugal also has a system where people are compelled and guided to identify their needs and they are then transitioned into supports including treatment. You have to have both. One alone won't work. I mean we have treatment in, in British Columbia, not enough. I mean when somebody's in the criminal justice system and severely addicted, the biggest challenge is can I get them in? It might be months down the road meanwhile they relapse. Right? And so uh, th th there's all kinds of gaps. So Portugal has done that. The social, uh, the, the Nordic countries, um, uh, more social democratic from Denmark to Norway to Finland to Sweden, Netherlands, they, they do fund greater uh, resources for programs, for treatments, for housing, for example. Housing is a big piece of all this. If you don't have housing, you don't have a proper place to go to the toilet or take a shower or clean yourself, it's very dehumanizing and you're extremely vulnerable on the streets. Everything just goes downwards. Employment opportunities, skills development, counseling, medical and uh, mental health services, all of these kind of things, these are investments that they have used and the evidence is that it works. So again, I go back to the Butner and Lepard report. I think it shows us a way forward. I also think that there is there are thoughtful voices in our society, including in the city of Kamloops, from the business community, from police to counseling, mental health, um, social services, uh, housing advocates as to what is needed. But you know, we, we need to take at a at certain level the rhetoric out of it and people who attack, uh, you know, basically trying to demonize and dehumanize uh, people who come before the criminal justice system or who are addicted or are homeless. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I have great faith in Canadians. They're, they're compassionate people, they're reasonable people, but we need to get past the rhetoric and we need to stop politicizing the criminal justice system and have me a meaningful conversation because we have these acute problems. Now, you know, over the years, we have cut services, you know? I mean, this is always the tension philosophically and politically, less government, or we want from government. As a candidate, I found it really ironic when I campaigned, I heard a lot of I want, I want, but nobody wants to pay for it. Mm. And, well, we need to have a mature conversation. Obviously, governments have to prioritize resources and there's a lot of challenges, but crime, mental health, homelessness, uh, the, the impact on the business community, on people's enjoyment of our public parks or our, our streets and our downtown, that has an economic cost as well. I mean, to warehouse somebody in a provincial jail, even 15 years ago, was $80,000. We've had inflation since then, a year. Federal prison is even more expensive, right? Um, policing. Um, and, and people ending up in emergency, uh, ending up in, in psychiatric beds at the hospital. This is very, 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 very expensive. A hospital bed is a very expensive proposition. So we have to look at what our prevention 
techniques? What are prevention resources? What are the services people need and provide them? Otherwise, you can send people to jail, they'll come out, they won't be treated, and we'll continue to have that, that cycle. So I, I just repeat myself again that I think people have unrealistic and misinformed expectations of the criminal justice system. As a judge, I used to sit there. It's heartbreaking when you have to say to a single mom who's before you in criminal court or in child protection, I can't get you a house. <laughs> Welfare rates are well below the poverty rate. Are you going to the food bank? But what kind of nutrition are you getting? Right? I mean, studies have shown, for example, in Great Britain that, that children, poor, children from poor families are three times greater to have mental illness than somebody from a wealthy family. So if we believe we want a fair and just society that avoids these criminalizations and demands on our social welfare system and on our health system um, um, down the road and people's uh, lack of employability because they lack the skills because of family neglect, because of trauma, because of poverty, a lack of housing and so forth, then we have to say, how are we going to address this and do we under address underlying causes and make those investments or do we just carry on? And if we carry on, we're not going to solve the problem. And throw on top of that um, the serious drugs flooding into the country, meth being made easily now in labs, um, this is a really toxic mix that's destroying a lot mm -hmm. of lives. So with respect to uh, um, the countries that you've pointed to, Scandinavian countries, Portugal, um, It's been suggested that those countries were always like that. Um, and in Canada, we're different. Um, were they always like that? Or did they go through a progressive change that we must now go through? So what I would say is, of course, we are somewhat different, but there's many similarities too. So it's, it's not complicated to say, what are the best practices that are suitable for us? in our population, in our society, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and reasonable people can do that. I mean, we have a lot of intelligent people in this country. It's a question of values and will. Are we gonna do this, right? So, you know, people may say, well, Sundu is defending the criminal justice system and they, there's a lot of anecdote out there. But, you know, Butler Lepard and others say, here's the evidence, right? I mean, we, we have leaders in this country who are saying, oh, uh, safe drug supply is destroying our communities and is leading to deaths. But the evidence is, and we've had this from the BC coroner, we've had it from BC Health, Benjamin Perrin, you know, who's a, a professor at UBC, have said, no, that's, let's look at the evidence. Let's be responsible about the facts and the truth, you know, that, that people that are dying are dying from illicit, illegal, profit-driven drugs fentanyl and, and, and cocaine and heroin laced with fentanyl. So uh, where you have safe supply, at least we're preventing people from dying. You can't treat people and rehabilitate them if they're dead, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, so, but that alone, um, safe supply isn't the solution. It's one small piece of a bigger puzzle. And so um, we need to get past the rhetoric and the politicization and the partisanship and have an honest conversation. And sometimes that's lacking. Mm -hmm. But I do think there, we, are, we are getting a consensus around this. I mean, I'm pleased when I hear um, leaders in our community, in the business community, uh, or certain people not just simply saying, you know, lock them up blame the justice system, they're starting to say, yeah, we understand there's a housing thing. We, you know, we don't build enough houses in this country, right? Um, the federal government largely got out of housing in the 90s. Uh, we, we need private, we need a mix of par private, public, and social housing. If I've seen in my work, housing is crucial. If you have housing, then it's easier to plug in other services. If you don't have housing and people are bouncing around from shelter to shelter and homeless, it's very, very difficult to provide consistent services to people for them to access it and for us to access them and help them. They're on a downward spiral living on the streets. They themselves are vulnerable. There's drugs. There's, um, I mean, how dehumanizing it is if you can't even find a toilet, right? You shower yourself. Who's going to employ you? Who's going to even want it? we avoid them. They're fellow mm -hmm. human beings. So if I was to summarize what
what you've been saying. It sounds to me like there are three major areas where we need to look for solutions. Number one is in housing. Number two is creating a more complex, uh, robust healthcare system. And then number three is perhaps some best practice and legislative changes with regards to the way that our judicial and uh, correction systems work. Yes, so the thing about, I think a lot of the tools are already in the criminal justice system, corrections, but the, the thing is we need that, that are external to the court, the justice system, those services we can properly plug people into. Now we're, we're trying, but often they're not there or they're inadequate, right? Um, so, you know, the, the tools are there. Like, like the, the reality is I don't want anyone to think, oh, Sandhu is saying being soft on crime. Like I said, you know, I'm told my reputation was a law and order judge. I sent people to jail when they needed to go. No mm -hmm. BS, right? You're going. Cut the crap. Um, for the protection of the public or that was the appropriate and fair thing to do. I've even had over the years, you know, um, a, a person stop, more than once, several times, stop me on the street and say, judge? I said, I'm not a judge anymore. Yeah, but you were the judge that sentenced me and you sent me to jail. And you kind of think, okay, what's this guy going to say? Maybe those that were unhappy never say anything, but I've had people come up to me and say, you sent me to jail and thank you. You, 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 what you said to me gave me hope, but you held me accountable, but you also said something to me that made me felt understood and, and treated as a, as a human being. Now, I'm not bragging, I expect other judges get that too, but I'm just saying that, that there are appropriate cases when people should go to jail. The system needs to look at that, where's the gap, okay? But, mm -hmm. but overall, overall, um, that, of course, is, again, just one small piece of it. Many, many people, I mean, if somebody is brain injured, suffered brain trauma, FAS, addicted to seriously to drugs and alcohol, poor, impoverished, homeless, then we have to also look at those elements as part of the overall mix to reduce criminal offending. And now, criminal offending is just one piece of this. We also want healthy communities. We want thriving communities. You know, we have growing inequality in our society, gaps between the wealthy and the, not, and the poor. And studies clearly show over and over and over, um, societies that are more equal and have these resources are societies that have less violence, less mental illness, they have less teenage pregnancy, they have better educational outcomes for people, they have um, uh, uh, higher life expectancies, and so all of this is part of the ball of wax of what kind of society do we want? And we've got to get past rhetoric. We've got to get past us and them. Mm -hmm. We're all in this together. And if we're all in this together, then we have to solve it together. And we have to have a meaningful conversation, a mature conversation. It starts at the top as well. What we say to our politicians, they will react to, to say, we want these things. Where's the funding? Or how are we going to fund it? okay, well, do we need to relook at our tax system? Now, some people will say, oh, well, well you just want more taxes, son. Do you're, you're a social democrat. I am a social democrat. But that doesn't mean that everybody pays more taxes. We, we haven't looked at reforming our tax system since the Carter Commission in the 60s. The world has changed. It's much more complex. The nature of our economy, our lifestyle, women entering the workforces, on and on and on, technology. So we have to look at what's fair taxation or reform um, and quite frankly, those that are extremely, extremely well off, billionaire class, multimillionaires, how much do you need? Maybe you should pay a little bit more for the health of your society. You know, I saw a cartoon, uh, a cartoon where there's a, a, an executive in a limousine and he says to his driver, I just got a $200,000 tax cut. Gee, I love this country, but why is it such a dump? And, and, and it displayed homelessness and, you know, stuff going on on the streets and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, people will disagree with me. That's fair enough. Um, th there's a debate to be had there. But I think we need to look at that. Like, where are our appropriate investments? And we do lack the health and social services, the housing and, and, and the psychiatric complex, psychiatric, psychological services that people need over an extended period of time. And also... Um, 
the kind of uh, facilities that we need for some people. Like for some people, uh, it, it might not be just a regular jail, but a separate unit that specialized with forensic services, psychologists and nurses and doctors. For those people that have those serious mental health issues, they don't meet the definition of what we used to call insanity, which we call mental disorder, uh, not criminal responsible due to mental disorder. So there's a huge gap in the system. But they are at risk of serious harm to the community or to others, then we need those kind of things too in our jails. And then we need it in our communities too, especially northern half of BC. There's a, uh, even worse than in the urban centers for lack of services and facilities for people. Is that is that what the the hillside psychiatric facility behind Royal Inn Hospital is? So, so, so th 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 I'm not an expert in that area, but basically, you know, under the Mental Health Act, police can take people to psychiatric facilities, but there's an outpatient where people are released shortly and they do it from their home. Um, and then there's an inpatient, but they're only kept for a certain period of time and they're let go. But we need, they have more complex needs. And so that whole wraparound issue, and a lot of people in this community talk about wraparound services. I mean, members of our city council have talked about it as well. There's the housing element, but then you need those services there, right? So uh, in fairness to, to governments as well, you know, they're scrambling too now. A lot of demands uh, arising, which have become more acute out of the pandemic. So we need a, a sustainable approach that mm -hmm. will take multi years, but some things can be done immediately and some will take longer. So with respect to, I, mean, I made a note here of the, uh, uh, the, the, that study that was done by, that you mentioned. Uh, uh, Butler and Lepard? Butler and Yeah, Lepard. that was a report for the British Columbia government, a 150 page report that came out in September of 2022, last year. Okay. Um, I know you to be a human rights activist, to be a human rights lawyer, one that has done a lot of work with vulnerable populations. Um, we're talking about involuntary treatment. We're talking about forced treatment when they might refuse it. What is your personal take on that as a okay. as a, a human rights activist? I mean, we don't we have a, a don't we have a constitutional problem with that? Well, thank you for that question. It's a good question. So, I get one usually every interview. <laughs> uh, you're doing quite well. Thank you. This is, it's a good conversation. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about these very complex problems. No simplistic answers. So, yes, right now, in large measure, there are constitutional problems that say you cannot involuntarily just send people off, right? We have a criminal justice system where you can send people to jail. We have forensic psychiatric services for the most, most, most unique. Usually they have to commit a criminal offense. Uh, and, and if they're found not criminally responsible due to mental disorder, we used to call that insanity. They go off to a forensic facility for a certain period of time. Um, and some people who are very, very uh, seriously psychiatrically challenged can end up in those facilities as well. But that's a small percentage of the people with significant mental illness and mental health issues that are in a gap, lost, not dealt with. So he, here's my take. I think it's worth a try, and it's this. Butler and Lepard said the federal government has to pass the legislation. That's one. I think judges, because they're, they're people, they're of our society, if a proper case was prepared and presented and given to judges and said, there's going to be a degree of involuntarily, it's going to be these, these low security uh, facilities that we're talking about for people that have severe mental health issues, mental illness, combined perhaps with s severe addiction, and they are at high risk to commit offenses, to harm the community, including violent offenses. Will you find that this is constitutional if, and this is where you'd have to have the resources in place and you'd have to have the evidence to present in court to say, 
we're not just depriving them of their liberty because we don't like what they're doing and they're a nuisance and we want to take them off the street. In a sense, jailing them but not in a real jail, but effectively depriving of their liberty, that's not going to work. That's unconstitutional and open to abuse and we've seen societies around the world use psychiatric um, means to attack political dissidents and destroy them. Undemocratic human rights abuses. We saw this with the Soviet Union doing that a lot with dissidents. Anybody oppose the government, you're nuts, go off to the psychiatric facility and abuse them. Um, but if you were able to say these are the facilities, these are the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the nurses, the doctors, this is the program we have, we, and have expert evidence to testify to that, and that takes time to set up, I think there's a good chance judges would say we have a changing society, this is the problem we have in our communities across Canada, mm -hmm. and this is constitutional. Section 1 of our charter, we don't have, you like the United States, absolute 100% guaranteed constitutional rights in cir circumstances. We have Section 1 which says you can infringe certain rights as long as it's de de demonstrated as, as justified in a free and democratic society. In other words, it's consistent with the principles of a free and democratic society. I think that's worth a try, and I think a good uh, possibility exists if those things are done properly, properly, and that's the key. They need resources, they need time to set up. Courts in this country would say, this is constitutional, this is reasonable and measured and proportionate given the, the, the problems that we have in our society and the risks that flow from it. That's just Bill Sundu as a human rights lawyer, right? I mean, people often think that human rights are a luxury for good times, but actually our human rights were designed for the worst of times. They were designed in response to World War II and, and the abuses of the Nazis, including psychiatric. Uh, uh, racial discrimination, the murder of people, but our, our human rights also include economic, social, and cultural rights, and those include things like to a family life, to social security, to health care, to education, to housing. You see, we, we haven't realized those, and we are one of the richest countries in the world, and if we don't do it, what, what hope is there for the world? So it's a question of where do we want to go and how do we want to prioritize our resources? But I do think that that can be done. This looked at how the UK does it. Now they have a different constitutional framework than we have. But if, if we looked at it and properly set it up, then I think these low security units, if you want to call them, or service um, facilities would protect the public and also address the needs of these most severe, severe type of persons who aren't necessarily suitable for the jails or don't commit an offense that requires lengthy jail time. And the reality is too many people are coming out of jail and they're not rehabilitated. They not, haven't got those services, or they're, even if they have, there's not a continuum in the, in the community. They're thrown right back into the same environment. Like I said, precarious housing, uh, drugs in their community, poverty, lack of employment, those kind of things. So what is it that you think that the citizens of Kamloops could be doing after listening to you Let's say the vast majority of our population agree with you, but they don't know what they can do about it. What can they do? So, so you know, look, this is, this is something that requires collaboration between our municipal government, our regional district, community leaders, provincial governments, and federal governments. Healthcare providers, social service agencies, police, business community, criminal justice act uh, system actors. This is what it takes. But I think w it sounds the way you put it there, honestly, makes it sound like they've got better chances of winning the lottery than all those people coming. Well, together. look, the thing is, is, is we have people working on these things. It's now a question of persuading our political leaders to say, okay, are we going to put the resources in and do them? Now, when the Butler and Lepard uh, report came in, the government immediately said, this is what we can do. So, for example, they've created a special prosecution team to uh, look at what we call repeat offenders, the high op offenders, uh, because you can have a prosecutor here and a prosecutor there, and left hand may not know what's going on in, uh, to the right hand, different communities. But now to integrate it all, who are these people? 
who are the probation officers dealing with them, who are the uh, prosecutors dealing with them, that kind of thing. Um, and also uh, an assessment of what are the resources in the community to help people in these types of situations. What are what's out there? What can the lawyers do to be better informed about where what facilities that we do have? Where do they exist? What's suitable? Let's get psychiatric nurses in the courtrooms, right? Um, we, we That's need, not happening right now. Well, well, it is in some places, but not not consistently and not in many places. Also, you know, there's a whole separate segment of uh, issues around Indigenous peoples and their over-criminalization, impoverishment, and, and so forth, and a desire to, to, to have more say from Indigenous communities and setting up First Nations courts, restorative justice, like in Haida Gwaii, where I, I work once a month, one week, we do a lot of restorative justice. Those are small communities. People have to live with each other long after the, the judge and the prosecutor and, and even the police officers uh, or, or, or the defense lawyer and probation officer are gone. They got to live with each other in the same community. So we create a lot of uh, uh, restorative justice. That means there's accountability in the appropriate cases people do go to jail. In appropriate cases they are subject to court orders. But in other cases for lower offenses or where we think there's a possibility, we incorporate a lot of um, uh, reparations for harm done to the community, a reconciliation where people have to face each other and do things for each other because they're going to see each other every day in that small community. There's only a few stores. They're going to always see each other at the grocery store. They're going to see each other on the street. How do we create peace and reconciliation? And we are incorporating in that community Haida practices, Indigenous practices because that seems to have more buy-in by the community and overall it seems to work so you know the the, the, the indigenous community has said first nations uh, in bc have said you know we, we we have some acute unique needs and so we also want um have greater say in how these systems are run and that's also part of their report could we not as a colonial society learn from indigenous practice here? It sounds to me like um, the solutions are already being re-implemented in Haida Gwaii. Um, you know, I mean, Haida Gwaii has the same economic and social problems that other communities have. It has high addiction rates, residential school impacts, lack of housing, poverty, lack of employment. Um, but you are seeing a germination right through Canada, but I can certainly say in the Haida, we see it here at, uh, to come to Shwetmek as well. Uh, First Nations Court here and in Merritt, and I, I played a very, very small part in setting up the First Nations Court here, very small. Others did more than I did. Um, but you know, these, these are developments, right? But you have to uh, still address those underlying issues. But First Nations communities, I think um, the reality is if we want to solve the problems, we have to recognize the role of traditional justice not all alone, we incorporate it with, with, with our traditional system as well. I wanna uh, alleviate some, some st false stereotypes out there. Um, for an indigenous person, it doesn't mean, you know, if you're indigenous, there's a get out of jail free card. There isn't, indigenous people go to jail. Indigenous people sometimes offend against indigenous people victims as well. It's just that historically there hasn't been, well, there's been systemic racism and stereotypes and we are directed as lawyers and judges now to say, you have to look at the more fulsomeness of this person. Who are they? What's their background? What's their history? What is in the community that can support them? Who's their family in order to frame a more fair, balanced, um, reasonable and workable sentence? That's what in, 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 that's how we're dealing with it in the courts. Now, as far as um, incorporating restorative justice principles, I, you know, like I can tell you in Haida Gwaii, interestingly, it's kind of a, a cute little story, but it's real. I've been in court where there's Mr. Young Macho. He's hey, got a chip on his shoulder and he's going to show, he might be even actually insecure, but that's his demeanor in court to the judge and all these outsiders. But if you have the matriarchs sitting in the courtroom in the back and they look at him, I've seen them straighten up right then and there and stand up. And if, if, if the matriarch speaks up, even in court, and we'll invite them sometimes, these young men, they sit up and they listen. It's a matriarchal culture, the Haida. They listen. 
uh, it's remarkable, that individual accountability. So in restorative justice, if you have these people involved saying, this is what you've got to do, you've got to prove you're going to do this in the community, this is how you're going to make amends, this is how you're going to, pay, rec you're going to um, uh, apologize, this is what you're going to do, you're going to go to treatment, you're going to go to counseling, you're going to do this for the elders in the community, that seems to have more buy-in, and as a result, it seems to be quite effective. Now, not always, but overall it seems to be effective. Awesome. We're going to take one more break, and then we're going to wrap up right after the break. Sure. We'll be right back right after these messages. Friends, we are ready for more steps forward in the inclusion of mentorship into our businesses, our boardrooms, local governments, and agencies. Our nonprofit, AIM Canada Mentorship Society, relies upon your donations and attendance at one of the awareness creating and fundraising events. Our annual donors either contribute smaller amounts monthly or do a one-time annual donation prior to year-end. This is a request to donate now to support this docuseries and attend an awareness generating event such as the upcoming Finding a Way Forward dinner with guest speaker Alfred Achoiba and Jeremy Nisaw as our musician. In Canada, does community mentorship projects such as the Crisis Storm podcast and the Finding a Way Forward documentary series. This is a six part docuseries for the city of Kamloops with a goal of filming all aspects of the social crisis we are immersed in. Aspects that include homelessness, mental health, addiction, overdose, increased crime, concern for business and community safety, and the communication breakdown. This communication breakdown keeps us stuck instead of traveling the path to find humane and results oriented local community solutions. The Finding a Way Forward docuseries will be shared freely with the public, the business community, educational institutes, as well as local, provincial, and federal governments. Mastermind Studios, as producer, will be gathering and filming all voices affected by our community social crisis. As part of the process, professionals will be interviewed and leading edge research and proven practices will be incorporated throughout the community engagement and interview process. We are modeling respectful and inclusive communication and interaction. With your help, we can achieve critical mass, find solutions, find community acceptance, and implement lasting change for the better. This process and docuseries will move our community forward and show all where we can play an important role in the solution. If you are part of the business community, please consider a corporate donation for the Finding a Way Forward docuseries or corporate advertiser of the Crisis Storm podcast. Perhaps become a corporate sponsor for one of our mentorship awareness events. You could also become part of our corporate mentorship registration program. Many companies and agencies already have a mentorship program. For organizations like these, registering in our national program can help them reach students, graduates, and communities throughout Canada, as well as become known as mentorship corporations. In closing, I'd like to say this Crisis Storm podcast series is our first action step towards providing documentary research and bridging into the Finding a Way Forward docuseries. If you are able, we ask you to support this valuable, timely, and critical work by becoming an impact donor, a major funder, or attending one of our mentorship awareness events with keynote speakers or a corporate advertiser with the podcast series, Crisis Storm. 
We need your financial support. Please act now. Welcome back to the Crisis Storm, and we are wrapping up here with Bill Sundu, former British Columbia judge and human rights lawyer. We're talking about the impacts of crime and our justice system and corrections on our community and perhaps several other communities like ours. Uh, Bill, in, in our conversations back and forth um, and in the public, mm -hmm. you know, the police are often the first thought and um you know there's a lot of stories that go along with that i'm i'm going to share one because i think there's there's actually more than two sides to the coin um a thought occurred to me when we were just talking on break we uh we get upset when the police become exuberant in pursuing justice on our behalf. Sometimes we feel it's unjust. Um, and the thought occurred to me, you know, um, all through my childhood, even within my own family, what was I taught? And uh, one of the things that I was taught was when I stepped out of line, um, my guardians would say, you behave yourself, or I'm going to call that police officer. So what were they teaching me? They were teaching me that the police officer is the bad boogeyman that's going to come and take me away. Um, we're training our youth to be scared of police, not to trust police. And I think there's a lot of that right now. We're, 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 we're leveraging, as a community, yeah. we're leveraging yeah. um, the threat of police and we want them to come back and reinforce our threat, right, to make us right. Mm -hmm. would, would you agree with that statement? Yeah, no, I, th I think there's some truth in that. Um, you know, I was counsel for Robert Jakansky's mother, Sophia, and uh, I was interviewed a number of times. And, and what I said then, I still maintain, is that it takes a special kind of person to be a police officer. Uh, the police, when the police are often involved, it's the worst situation. People are at their worst. They're in a crisis. Um, and and they can, then, then there can also be fear of the police. Um, I think that we, we often put, and we continue to put police in an unfair situation. Uh, and when, we have situations of, of severe mental, you know, psychotic behavior, mental illness, uh, drug addiction is often intertwined with that. People with mental illness are using drugs, which reinforces each other in a bad way. Um, we often put police in that, and they're on the front line, and they're put in a, in a very difficult position. They're not trained for that. And then there are those odd occasions where people, I mean, police are law enforcement. They have a uniform, they carry a sidearm, they have a baton, they have pepper spray, handcuffs. It often can produce a reaction in, in the person that the police are dealing with that it, the situation can escalate. And our police officers really aren't trained and equipped to deal with these kind of uh, mental health issues, psychotic issues, so forth. So one of the things that, that, that's been recommended is that by the uh, Butler and Lepard is that we have uh, trained teams that involve non-police. It can be social services, mental health, uh, so forth, to, to deal with situations when they're identified that will maybe have the police secondary or in the background or not even involved in these other people uh, involved. Involved. Um, that re because you're not necessarily dealing with a criminal law problem, you're dealing with mental health and addiction and psychotic behavior or, or, or and, and whatever negative behaviors there are. So, but when you involve the police, you put the police in a bad situation, uh, it can escalate and um, it can result in criminal ch uh, charges that, that occur. I mean, just one I often hear about is resisting a police officer, assaulting a police officer. And I think, geez, you know, if the police officer hadn't got involved, this wouldn't have even happened. I'm not blaming the police officer. They get the call and, and, and they're put in that situation. So, and they're not trained for that necessarily. So 
we have to look at this alternative approach. And then in the community, because most people with mental health issues and addiction do not c commit criminal offenses, there's a huge gap. We have a little patchwork of things they may go to, but I think what we really need, and, and again, the Butner and Lepard re report talks about this, that we need substantial services, facilities in the community. There's no such thing as a wrong door, you know? Uh, it's integrated with health and social services and housing um, and so forth to help people that can go be, get help or be directed to, to be taken there, to get, get them assessed comprehensively and get a comprehensive plan to treat them. Now, that's not always going to work, but it's the best system I think that we can come up with. And overwhelmingly, it will stabilize people and help them. If people have services, if they have housing, uh, you know, they have the medication that they need that's prescribed for them, and somebody's assisting them, they know where they can go. Like I said, no wrong door. We set up these facilities. Then we will uh, greatly reduce um, the, the criminality, will greatly reduce the demands where now people are taken to the hospital often to emergency, um, and th that's not a good place either. Those facilities are not really equipped to deal with people with, with s these types of behaviors or addiction. You know, they can temporarily give them something to bring them down or, or to avoid the DTs, the shakes or whatever, but then they're cut loose and they're right back where they were. So th this is what we need. And so um, I, I, th I have faith in Canada, I have faith in our society because whenever we've come up with, often we don't respond until it's a crisis. We don't respond when we should. That's just the nature of our economic, social, even our environmental responses. Um, but I think it's come to, a, it is a crisis as you call it, Peter. And so I think we're starting to develop some, some key themes that need to be done. Now the question is, are we going to commit the resources and get these things done at a time of great many demands? But I don't think we have an alternative. Otherwise, we're going to continue with these problems. We're seeing, you know, in places in the U.S. and other parts of Canada, these problems are becoming more acute. You know, I mean, homelessness is a big one. If you can address housing in a meaningful way, and it takes time to build houses, doesn't it? And there's nimbyism, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, and and. I don't uh, at all dis, dis um, count when people say, well, they built this place in my neighborhood. Look, there's, there's these problems. But we need to have these other services provided. Uh, and, and I think substantially will stabilize if it's sustainable uh, and avoid these problems. There will always be new challenges. There will always be some people who fall through the cracks, but we can greatly reduce it. You know, there, I just want to say that, that I would hope you know, people, and people are busy, they have jobs, they have lives, could spend some time in a courtroom. Because I, I'm going to say the media performs a very important function, but too often sensational gets published. You know, we used to have that saying, if it bleeds, it leads from the newscast. But it, when you are in court and you see the whole picture, the victim, the evidence, the circumstances of the human being before you, it you can see the challenges, but also we're all human beings in, it, in this. And I think people might have hopefully a better understanding of why the judges impose the sentences they do or the limitations that the judges operate under. You see the good work that lawyers, there's many compassionate lawyers that they're trying their best in a difficult situation. Um, and our hands are tied as well. We, like I've said, the criminal justice system is a blunt instrument. When everything else fails in society, it ends up there. But we only can do certain things. And there's right. very limited things we can do. You know, as media, I, I would agree with you, uh, with the exception of we're often blocked from being able to film in court um, by court order and or the fact that um, we can't get release from an individual that's involved in the case and so therefore they can't appear, appear on Canada. You're right. You know, uh, for a number of years from 2008 to 2015 I was an executive member of the National Criminal Justice Section in Canada of the, of the Canadian Bar Association, the Lawyers Organization, which is comprised of prosecutors, academics and defense lawyers. And I actually wrote an article on social media, you know, it was coming then more, um, that we need to open it up. 
We need to open it up. I mean, wh why have all these old restrictions? I mean, there are certain situations where we need to protect the privacy of the individuals. Usually it's victims, um, protect their privacy, victims of sexual offenses, of certain types of domestic violence, things like that, because we want to protect their privacy, right? Right. Uh, avoid stigma to them. Um, but overall, it's vital that our courts be open and transparent, uh, that people need to know what's happening under the light of day in our, in our court system. Um, but I can just tell you that, that, and this is the good thing about human nature, in 40 years, it's very, very rare that I've dealt with a sociopath. Overwhelmingly, people are just victims. It's carnage of life. Parental neglect, residential schools, poverty, mental health, brain injury, addiction. Alcohol is still a big factor in a lot of criminalizing. Alcohol, you know, and it's legal, right? It's, it's marketed hugely in our society and readily available, along with now these very lethal drugs. We, we, we've driven a lot of people with our drug historically, how we've dealt with drugs underground. We need to bring it above ground and openly deal with it. And uh, over-criminalizing does drive people underground to the illicit substances and that kind of thing. Um, so, but I'll, we're dealing with human beings with all kinds of life problems and challenges, mm. a lack of employment as well as a big one. And so um, in the criminal justice system, we try to deal with it as best as we can. We have hope. There are successful stories. They're heartwarming. But again, we're often very challenged with very complex, difficult situations with a lack of resources and facilities in society. Before we wrap uh, and get your final thoughts, there is one other area which we really haven't talked about. We've talked about your experience now a little bit with regards to um, Indigenous law, mm -hmm. working with Indigenous people, um, the vulnerable, vulnerable populations, Indigenous women being over incarcerated, um, but we haven't really spoken about the impacts on children and youth. Um, and um, it's been suggested to me that there really has not been a lot of improvement with respect to the way that our court system deals with um, youth that are in troubled circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, one of the last vestiges that still hold out on old school seems to be uh, social services and their you know child and family welfare in the way that what was happening to in the 60s scoop still seems to continue to happen today and uh, you know what are your thoughts and hope for you know the next generation so um, when it comes to youth, what we used to historically call juveniles that come into criminal law trouble, uh, it's from age 12 to 18 their use. Um, the, the prosecutions of youths have greatly reduced over the number of years we had reform of what's now called the uh, Criminal Youth Criminal Justice Act. Um, there's a lot more tools for police, sanctions, extrajudicial sanctions, diversion, get resort, you know, counseling or whatever, uh, make amends because they're younger, they lack maturity, you can make a mistake. I think overall the youth situation's okay in this sense. From a criminal law perspective, we're prosecuting less, we're trying to deal with it in alternate ways, and I think that's good. That doesn't change the fact that great many youths, who then become adult offenders, or you just add people that we see as adults, if you look at their trajectory of their life, they invariably, not always, but invariably, um, grew up in poverty, parental neglect, um, serious addiction issues in their home, abused physically and mentally or even sexually abused. Great many offenders uh, have themselves have had very, very difficult and trying circumstances and people will say, oh yeah, well, you know, cry me a river, blah, blah, blah. But that does inform how that person got there. How can we help that person? 
because we're not a cruel society. We don't believe in retribution or vengeance, let's put it this way. We believe in accountability and protecting society. Um, now, children in care, yes, and, and I'm, I, I don't think that I'm properly qualified to comment on that in this sense. As a lawyer, before I became a judge, and when I was a judge, I did deal with child protection matters, but I haven't really dealt with child protection cases for the last 15 years, 16 years. Things have changed, but I think the evidence is incontrovertible that, and we hear this from many Indigenous leaders and other persons, that as many, if not more, Indigenous kids are in care now with the ministry, then we're at the peak of residential schools. This is a legacy of colonialism and residential schools, family breakdown, poverty, addiction, um, trauma, so forth. But we as a collective society in Canada are now grappling with the issue of truth and reconciliation and colonialism. And um, I am optimistic in this regard. There's always um, pushback. There's people who express their bigotry or ignorance. They don't know. But we do see the emergence of a consensus in Canada commitment to say, as I often say as a lawyer, I'm not going to tell or say to Indigenous people what I think should happen. I'm here to listen. For 150 years or 200, 300 years, we've told Indigenous people, and how's that worked out? I think Indigenous nations that are properly resourced are taking over child welfare. They're taking responsibility for that. We're seeing more Indigenous kids in some places placed with Indigenous families in their community, even if home is not suitable for them to be there, it's not safe to be in their home, um, rather than outside of the community. But that area remains an acute problem, and I think our Indigenous leaders are articulate, they are articulating their concerns, they are committed to helping their families, their communities. It's our collective responsibility as all persons in this country on traditional territory of Indigenous peoples to be part of the solution and support them. Because the way I look at it is, every child is our child. That child is my child, your child. That's our responsibility. When I was younger, my father was disabled. I was 10 years old. My mom washed floors and dishes. She worked late shifts. There were people who every now and then put an arm around me and guided me. Good citizens, good people every day with kind, gentle, simple acts sometimes make a difference and all of us have a collective responsibility at a human level but also to care for our neighbors but as a collective Canadian society to really meaningfully engage with um, Indigenous peoples in reconciliation. More responsibility, more jurisdiction, more authority over their resources, their families, uh, their children. I think that's the way forward. And I, and I see growth and germination of great young leaders. Uh, I see successes in certain communities. I see it in Williams Lake where I was raised with a great young indigenous chief and Willie Sellers. I see it with families, Haida families. I've seen it with kids here. You know, I mean, when I used to deal with custody cases every now and then, I mean, it's less now, but in the early years, somebody, I mean, that was the most emotional part. You'd be at Riverside Park or downtown and somebody would come and say, this is the child that you dealt with, Judge, and look how they're growing up and doing well. And you say, if I even got one thing right, that's good enough for me if I help one child. So ultimately, it's about a kind and understanding heart, not naive, but a kind and understanding heart for each of us to our fellow members of our community. The people on the street, our members, they have families, they have histories, they have their stories. We need to be part of the solution, as do they. I couldn't have said the words better than myself. Uh, any other final thoughts? No, thank you for the opportunity to 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 share my views. Um, you know, as I said at the outset, this is a very complex area, mm -hmm. society wide. I'm not saying I have the answers. I've shared some of my views, but they are complex. But we've dealt with complex problems in our history in the past, and we have solved them or greatly remedied them. And I think we have as many challenges as there are with this complex issue. We have no alternative but to address it head on, to have a healthier, safer, more compassionate, just society. And all of that is encapsulated by our human rights framework, human rights to housing, to health care, to safety, 
individual security and safety in our communities, to be able to walk and go where we want freely without hindrance or harm or fear. These are all integrally tied. And I think we, we have the ability to do it. So the challenge is let's roll up our sleeves and get on with it. It'll be challenging. There'll be frustrations, even some setbacks, but we have no alternative but to tackle it head on. Bill, thank you. My pleasure. You've been uh, watching The Crisis Storm. And uh, I'll take Bill's cue and say uh, we've been broadcasting to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Tecumseh Tshwetmik in Shepkwemek Ulu, uh, the traditional lands of the Shepkwemek people, otherwise known as the Shushwa people in the interior of British Columbia. Bill, thank you for joining us. My Until pleasure. next time. This has been the Crisis Storm.